Okay, uh, shall we start? Yes, we can start. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Paris Elahi from Physics Department. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Professor Donna Strickland as today's physics colloquium speaker. Donna Strickland obtained her, uh, uh, her bachelor degree in engineering physics from McMaster University in 1981 and a PhD in optics from University of Rochester in 1989. During her PhD with her supervisor, Professor Gerard Muro, she developed a technique for amplifying pulses to very high optical intensity while avoiding excessive nonlinear pulse distortion or optical damage. This novel technique is called chair pulse amplification or CPA shortly. Development of chair pulse amplification is a major breakthrough and it significantly changed the field of laser science, especially fiber lasers and their industrial and medical applications. The developed technique pre, uh, paved the way toward the most intense laser pulses ever created. The research has several applications to the in industry and medicine, for, in, uh, for instance, including the cutting of a patient cornea in laser eye surgery and in material processing, let's, uh, for example, for a small glass parts, machining of small glass parts for using cell phones. For developing chair pulse amplification technique together with Gerard Muru, Donald Strickland was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in uh, 2018. Strickland was a research associate at the National Research Council Canada, a physicist at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and a member of technical staff at Princeton University. In 1997, she joined the University of Waterloo where her ultrafast laser group developed high intensity laser system for nonlinear optics investigation. Estriclon was named a companion of the Order of Canada. She is a recipient of a Sloan Research Fellowship, a Premier's Research Excellence Award and a Cotter Scholar Award. She received the Rochester Distinguished Scholar Award and the Eastman Medal from the University of Rochester. Strickland served as the president of the Optical Society of America, OSA, in 2013 and is a fellow of OSA, OSA, the Royal Society of Canada, SPIE. She's an honorary fellow of the Canadian Academy of Engineering as well as the Institute of Physics. She received the Globe, a Golden Plate Award from the Academy of Achievement and holds numerous honorary doctorate. The title of her talk is Making Really Short Pulses of Light. Dr. Strickland, thank you again for accepting our invitation. Thank you, happy to be here. So I have, before COVID, you know, I went around the world and I was giving my Nobel lecture. Um, it's already on YouTube, so I've come up with a new talk. So I hope it goes well. This is the first time giving this talk, whereas I've given the other one about a hundred times now. Um, and so really my whole career has been about working with short pulse lasers. And uh, so I am at the University of Waterloo as the sign shows you <laughs> uh, in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. And so I'm really just gonna walk us through why would people wanna make really short pulses of light, the various ways that people do it. And then the end of my talk is about a way that we're working at Waterloo um, to make short pulses. So let's if I can get this started here. All right, so this picture is a pretty standard picture for people um, that talk about why do you want short pulses? And it's been a, a quest for over a hundred years. And so I don't even know what the problem was, but in horse racing, there was one kind of trotting that people went, are all the legs off the ground at the same time? Some people would say, yes, they saw it. Some people said, no, they never saw it. But of course, our own sight is not something we can record. And so it was Edward Mybridge who set up a series of cameras so that he could take the picture of the running horse at different times. And sure enough, let me just get my pointer here. I hope you can see my point. It's this picture here that, you know, sort of 
stop the argument that indeed all the legs were off the ground at one time. And so you could see this because the shutter speed of a camera is on the order of milliseconds. And the speed of the horse, because it is a heavy, heavy thing, um, <laughs> is certainly able to be seen in this kind of time scale. And also you want to see that he set up several pictures in order to find it, right? So this will be important going forward too. So then, what if you want to see something faster than a, uh, you know, a heavy moving horse? And Harold Edgerton was the one who said, let's forget worrying about how fast can a mechanical shutter move because that's moving mass and so it takes time. And so instead you can be in a dark room and have just a flash of light. And then that's the only photons to reflect off and come back. And so now you can take even shorter uh, exposures, not based on how fast a mechanical shutter can move, but on how short the pulse of light is. All right, and so he came up with this electronic flash and now you could see things on a microsecond time scale and that stops the action of even faster motion. In this case, it's a speeding bullet, but you can also see how the apple is being destroyed also and how the uh, particles are moving out of the apple. And so this moved it along. I will also say that he also started with the stroboscope idea. So you can watch this, you know, this pictures of either a basketball in motion. This time, because it's flashes of light, he just simply left the single frame and you take several pictures in a row and now you can watch motion as it happens. So that's now a microsecond and we're into the 20th century. So still moving forward, might, what, what might we wanna see? Now, this is my version of, um, animations with PowerPoint. So I could only do so much because I'm only so good with animations in PowerPoint. But we're going to think about a molecule. We're going to think about it in a classical idea so that these are atoms. This will be oxygen, carbon, and oxygen. So this is a molecule CO2. Now, you know, quantum mechanics would tell you uh, there's not really a ball here. Carbon's not really a ball. Oxygen's not really a ball. There really isn't a string between them. But we do have this idea that there's sort of a center of mass for oxygen, a center of mass for carbon, center of mass for oxygen, and a bond between them. We also know that nothing is ever standing still. And so, oops, let's see how I can do this. Does it work? Okay. So this one is demonstrating that it could be having a stretch like this, which is called an asymmetric stretch, where the oxygens move together compared to the carbon. Um, but it may not be that. It could be the other one. This one's showing the symmetric stretch. And let's say we wanted to try to see that. There's also bending, but I could not figure out how to animate that. So let's just go with these two. Now, oxygen and carbon are going to move on sort of, you know, it's going to oscillate on the 10 femtosecond time scale. So if we want to do what was done with the horses and then the bullets and what have you, we're going to need flashes of light that are on the order of single femtoseconds. Certainly, it's maybe not to see simple molecules like this, but you can imagine bigger molecules and that we put energy in and we actually want to watch how this energy through motion is you know, going through the bigger molecule. We want to take these same kind of stop action movies, only it's now going to be on a single femtosecond time scale. So we would have one that puts the energy in and then at given time delays, another short pulse goes in to stop the action. But a molecule is still a very tiny thing. It's not a bullet, it's certainly not a horse. So we can't just use a regular camera, right? We can fi maybe figure out how to make the short pulses of light, but that's not enough. We have to have some way of seeing these molecules. Oops. So how do we see a molecule vibrating? So at each stopped action image, we want to, we're not gonna, like I said, we aren't gonna take an image of what this atom looks like, but we wanna determine the distance between the atoms. We have to have some way of saying oxygen was here, carbon was here, oxygen was here at this moment in time, right? So what do we do? We're gonna use something called Coulomb explosion imaging to make these movies. So what is Coulomb explosion imaging? So now I'm just gonna, Think about a two atom molecule, okay? Oxygen, nitrogen, whatever. So let's just think about that. 
So this is, it would be vibrating and we want to stop this action. We go in with a short pulse. There it is. And you aim it at the molecule. And this short pulse is not going to just be short. It's also going to be intense enough that we can cause it to ionize both atoms. All right. And then it's gone. So in that sort of maybe single femtosecond of time, we've gone in and we've ionized both of these atoms. In a molecule, these atoms are sitting just angstroms apart, tenths of a nanometer apart. So what does this mean? We've all gotten static electricity in our hair and realized our hair flies apart. Hopefully most of you have gotten to see these demonstrations where people have these very light balls, we call pith balls. We rub glass and, and rubber with fur and silk and, and we can charge these pith balls and we watch the pith balls come apart because there's a Coulomb force between these charges. Now they come apart, it's not dramatic, but that's because these pith balls, A, have mass, <laughs> a lot of mass compared to a single atom. Also, they're sitting millimeter apart. These guys are sitting one tenth of a nanometer apart. So that's more than a million times closer, these two charges. And we have to remember that the Coulomb force is inversely proportional to the distance squared, or the energy that is contained in this is one over the distance. So if you have a million times closer distance, this is a million times more energy. And so these two charges have to fly apart, boom, okay? And so what, so they don't stop there either until they get stopped, but, but what we measure, right? So we can't measure, we can't see that molecule because it's so tiny and optics are, the wavelength is too big. What we can measure is the final speed and also the direction that these atoms took, all right? So again, if you go back to the three atom one, you could actually measure that one went off and two went this way. If they were both have, moving this way at the time of the image, you would also see that because it would take longer to come back. So there's different things that you can measure, but through this Coulomb explosion imaging, we can figure out where were these atoms sitting at the time that the very short pulse went in. All right, so how do we ionize though? I said that the short pulse not only had to take the snapshot in time, but it also had to do this ionization. Now these pulses are usually in the near infrared. This means the photons are in the near infrared. A photon is the minimum energy unit of light. This, the energy of a photon is dependent on its color or wavelength, all right? So of the light we see from the red to the violet, the lowest energy or longest wavelength we see is red and the highest energy or shortest wavelength is violet. So we have infrared, and so it's even less energy than what we see in the red. And so it takes many, many photons of energy like this to send the electron out of this well. So I wanna say this well is the opposite of what I just talked about in Coulomb explosion. In an atom, you have the electron that's a negative charge, very near the positive uh, ionic core. And so they're held together in the same way as the other one would shove it apart. And so it's in this sort of Coulomb potential that we have to get ourselves out of. So it takes many, many photons all working together. Those little people are my photons, all working together to get the electron out. So how do we get photons to work together? Oops. No. There we go. So this is something that comes from my uh, Nobel talk, uh, sort of pushed together here. Uh, there's nonlinear optics and there's multi-photon physics. It took me a long time. It took me over 30 years working in the field to know there was a difference. Uh, I now know that atomic and molecular physicists talk about uh, multi-photon physics because they watch what happens to the atom and molecule where we optics people call it nonlinear optics, because we usually are watching what happens to the optical beam at the end of the process. But in any case, it's the same. It's the idea that light is interacting with matter and an atom is seeing more than one photon at the same time. So it's Maria Gobert Mayer. Now she's the second woman to have won a Nobel Prize. 
but she won it for the nuclear shell model, which has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. But when she was in grad school, she came up with the theory to show that it was indeed possible quantum mechanically for an atom to absorb more than one photon at a time. So she started the whole field of multi-photon physics. Nicholas Bloomberg won um, later on a Nobel Prize, but he's considered the father of the nonlinear optics, okay? And worked out the optics of, of these two colors uh, or two photons being absorbed at once. So nobody saw it though. Maria Gobert Mayer was doing this work in 1931. She published her work in 31, doing her PhD in 1930. Nobody saw it until 1961. And the reason nobody saw it until 1961 is because the laser didn't come along. When we had ordinary light, we couldn't see it. But when the laser came along, we could see this nonlinear optics happening. And why? You'll see here, these are my red photons again. They're not very energetic themselves, but in a laser, you'll see they all dance to the same beat. This is what we call coherence. And because of coherence, they can really get themselves jammed in there tight. This is another way of saying you have a big giant wave. Classically, we think of light as a wave. And if you have this great big wave, it really means that the photons have gotten themselves in there densely packed. Now we can only focus light to its wavelength. This is why we can't image molecules with a microscope. So these are one micron in wavelength, so we can get down to one micron. As I've already said, an atom is a much tinier thing. Let's blow it up. And we need to see more than one photon in this interaction volume. That's the cross-sectional area of how big is the atom. The third dimension, the length that we're not showing here, is the length along this pulse, or it's the interaction time. All right, so you have to remember that light, although my photons seem to be standing still, they're always moving at the speed of light. And so the length of a pulse or the time duration of a pulse is the same thing, it's just that it's related to the speed of light. So if we want to squeeze in the third dimension, we have to squeeze down the length of the light pulse. So let's talk about that because that's really what my PhD was about. So this also comes from uh, my Nobel lecture. One of the things that I find amazing about uh, light is how fast it travels, okay? So let me just use, no, I can't see me. I should be trying to see me, but let me just see if I can see me. Maybe not, oh. eh, I can't do anything with this laser pointer up here. Okay, well, that's not gonna work. So you can tell me if you can see me. Uh, let me turn this on. Can you see me with, the light on my hand? Yeah. Yes? Yes. Okay, good. All right. So I'm going, this is a laser pointer that if I was there speaking uh, to you, I would be using my laser pointer. And so I have this laser pointer. It's a one milliwatt beam. And that's because we don't want it to hurt anybody uh, if we shine it in the light. I can tell you that I can hold it on my hand and it doesn't hurt. All right. And so now let's think about that. It's a one milliwatt beam, that's power. That's energy per unit time. Now I could shine this out, my window that's right beside me here. I won't, just in case a child is playing. But I could make a one, I could shine it to the moon, like it's shown in the picture. I could make a one second light pulse just by opening and shutting my fingers and sending the beam off, all right? And what's amazing, because light travels so fast, is that in that one second, the beginning of the laser light pulse is about two thirds of the way to the moon, right? The end of the pulse is still here on earth when I'm shutting my fingers. And so it's a pulse or a string of light that's 300,000 kilometers long, right? Now power is energy per time. So in this one second light pulse, if it's this beam and it's one milliwatt in power, that's one millijoule of energy you know, one second long pulse of light. Now I'll tell you that the uh, paper that I published that won the Nobel prize was a laser that only had a millijoule of energy, okay? And we talk about it being so intense. I'm telling you every second, a millijoule of energy is hitting my hand and I don't feel it, right? Because sometimes it's energy that matters, but sometimes, and nonlinear optics is one of those times, it's the energy per unit time, per unit area, which is sort of is the same as energy density. 
So when the laser first came along, it wasn't a continuous laser, it was a pulsed laser. Oops, I'm not used to using these arrows to do this. Okay, and it was a millisecond long. So that's a thousand times shorter. It was also a joule of energy. So a thousand times more energetic, so a million times more intense. And so that's why not linear optics could happen. But a millisecond pulse is still 300 kilometers long. That's still a tremendously long length of pulse, all right, 300 kilometers. So, you know, for my first CPA laser, we had it down to a picosecond, all right? So it's only 300 microns or a third of a millimeter. We'd squeeze that light that comes out of this laser, you know, every second, and we squeezed it all down. So now it was less than a millimeter. So it went from 300,000 kilometers down to that. And so we really squeezed all of those photons. So that's how you get an intense pulse, is that the short pulse helps it be intense. You still need some energy, right? To do the a glass um, machining that was talked about in my bio, you need almost that millijoule of energy if you have a picosecond. The lasers that do that work are 100 femtoseconds long, and so they need something like 100 microjoules. They actually can do it with less because they focus down pretty tight, all right? But now we're talking about trying to see molecules, so we want a single femtosecond. So we can do this ionization with energy that's about a microjoule. So we have to keep that in mind. We still need a microjoule of energy. All right, so short pul pulses do help us image molecules in two ways. They're short, so it stops the action of this rapid motion, but also it helps us generate the intensity needed for this Coulomb explosion. We do have to ionize those atoms in the molecule. All right, so now let's go back to how do we even make a short pulse? A short pulse, if again, if you think about this green laser, it's only one color, it's only green, and it's on all the time. When we teach lasers, this is what we talk about is that we can get these single colors. Usually that's how we start by teaching lasers. If you can pick out the green, I don't know, it's sort of here, this one, all right. But then we can do these different colors. Now, this is just a drawing because as I said, the red color that we can see to the violet color we can see there's almost a factor of two difference and we haven't made it that drastic here. All right, so, but the idea is if you can take all of these different colors and say at this point in time and time and space, we're gonna be all at a peak and then you start moving. Of course, the red is further away than the violet. And by the time you get down here, there's as much um, wave up as there is down. And so it cancels out. And so only where they all peak can you get this one pulse? This black one is the addition of all of them, okay? And so the more colors you bring in, the shorter this pulse becomes. And so this is what's known as a Fourier transform. Fourier figured this out first. The more wider the color uh, bandwidth is, the shorter the pulse. Both is the opposite, right? If you want just a single color, you have to be longer in time. So that's why this has to be on all the time in order to get that one color it has to be there by itself all along. All right, so the other thing that I want to bring up is the fact that this one color, this red, let's say this is the fundamental one, goes on and on and on and on. Now let's start talking about bringing in its harmonics. Harmonics then, if, if it's this uh, frequency, we're going to double that. So we have two, you know, a period is crest to crest, now in that same time, we get to a crest and the second crest. This is the third harmonic, one, two, three, fourth and fifth. These are the ones I'm showing you now. Again, this would not be the colors because the fifth harmonic of red is well beyond what we can see. All right, so what does that mean? If you look at it, if you say, this is where we're gonna time them all up, that's true. But one period of this fundamental frequency, they've all timed up again and again and again. And so you can get a train of pulses coming out. It's true that the more colors you bring in, the more the closer this would be to zero, and then you'd have all the intensity here, all right? And so the shorter you can make this, the longer part you make that, then you sort of squeeze all the photons, not to be continuously, 
but to be jumping up here, really dense here, zero, really dense here, zero. But nevertheless, if you think about it, and I could actually make this one do that and had the colors, you would still see it looking like this, right? There would still be at the same average power. And so the average power is the total number of energy in all of these spikes divided by this total amount of time, right? It would still be low. It's only the peak power. That's the energy in a pulse, just the energy here divided by the time of the pulse. That would tell us how dense the photons are right here. All right, now we talk about making all these colors and the white light and the sunlight that's you know, illuminating me have all the colors. So why do we need lasers? Well, that's because when light comes out of a light bulb, all these colors come out, but they aren't talking to each other. They all come whenever they feel like it, okay? And so there's no time where they're all lined up nicely together. Now this drawing here is just my PowerPoint drawing. There's, I didn't try to you know, figure what's going on here. This is not an actual calculation, but the idea is you can still get short spikes from this, but they're random. And you don't get these perfect zeros either because there's light at some point always there. To get perfect zeros, you have to have perfect cancellation as well. All right. So now that's why you need a laser. Oh, I should also say, what if you went to the trouble and made these perfectly short pulses and it requires this enormous amount of bandwidth, then going through glass, all colors travel different speeds. This is called dispersion. But even air is enough if the pulse is really short to have dispersion. Now, for my chirped pulse amplification, I used dispersion in a fiber. So what do I mean by that? I didn't want a short pulse, I wanted a long pulse, and I started with a short pulse. So what do we do? Well, so when it comes to absorption or interaction of light with molecules or atoms, the atoms are quantized energy as well. And the photons have their quantum of energy and they try to talk to each other. And if they're almost the same energy, then they think they have a lot in common. And then they hang around together for a long time. But eventually if they're not absorbed, if they're not that much in common, it goes on. Now, these quantum levels of the atom are usually in the ultraviolet. That means the blue has the most in common and hangs around the longest green less so, and red has nothing in common and they hardly speak and on they move. And so as you go through glass, you will find that the red travels faster, the green sort of walks along and the blue crawls. And if you go a long time through glass, like I did with my kilometer of fiber, we can stretch the pulse and make it long. Sometimes we want to do that, but sometimes it's happening and you just have to be aware it's happening so you can do something about it. Luckily, we can do something about it. So we've all hopefully seen light through a prism and we know that light through a prism, the different colors go off at different angles. This again is because the light is traveling at different speeds in the glass and when it comes out, the speeds back up again. Gradings, this is what I'm trying to show you here is a grading, but a grading does a similar thing. And so now if we had a long pulse that's gone through dispersion and you want it to get to be a short pulse, you'll see the red photon is out ahead of the green photon, out ahead of the blue photon. And now watch the path it takes through these gradings. The red bends the most. And the blue um, bends the least. And so when it comes off the two parallel gradings, right, these angles have, this angle has to be the same as that angle. And the blue angle has to be the same as the blue angle because these are parallel. We've put them all back together in time. And so this is using what's known as angular dispersion. So we have material dispersion, and we also have these other things. We could use prisms as well, um, have angular dispersion. There's other more complicated things, but we can play with these and put our long pulse short as long as it isn't random times between them. We have to know what it is and if it's there and constant, we can do something about it, okay? All right, so we want all these colors. How do we get all these colors? Again, as I said, a laser is in normally a single color. 
And a lot of people, when you ask them, what process is it that makes a laser a single color? Most students in a laser class at the beginning, and I've taught many, so I can tell you this is true, they will think it's because of stimulated emission. That's in the uh, acronym of laser. It's uh, light amplified by stimulated emission, emitted radiation. I'm gonna come back to that and, and tell you that of course that has something to do with it, but it's not what makes it really single color. What makes a laser really single color is the fact that we use a cavity. It's two mirrors. So the simplest one is just a mirror here, another mirror some distance L away, some length away. And the light goes back and forth and back and forth, but light's a wave. So this is the same idea as if you just had a skipping rope and you were just trying to skip. There's only, you can make a standing wave pattern. You can see the same wave in the skipping rope if you do it just right. But it has to be at a node or at a zero at the two ends. And then this is the fundamental one. You can fit one half of a wavelength in here. If there wasn't a mirror, it would be over here. It, the mirror turns it around, it comes here and it meets itself again, okay? If it wasn't, if you did slightly different wavelength, you would find that it's not at a null here. And so then it sort of cancels itself on the way back. You could fit in any number of these as long as the half, n times those half wavelengths fit inside the cavity. Those are the only wavelengths allowed in the laser. So if you're trying to make a single colored one, you would have it such that only maybe this one here um, is allowed. This one would see gain, this one would not see gain or this one would see loss and this one would not see loss. And it's only this one wavelength of all the many, many possible wavelengths that fit in here because you can have more and more and more of these loops. So it is the cavity that makes this coherence even better that says there's only one wavelength. But obviously for those of us in short pulses, we don't want just one wavelength. We want all of the wavelengths we can get, okay? So, we're looking for a laser that we can actually have many, many, many of these lazy modes all operating at once. Again, I want to remind you the wavelength is given by twice this length divided by some integer n. All right, so we do something called laser mode locking. Now I'm not really gonna teach it to you. I'm just gonna uh, tell you it's sort of like an orchestra conductor. Imagine going to hear an orchestra and they're all tuning up their instruments before they start to play. They're all playing their own notes at their own time, doing their own thing. And it really doesn't sound pretty, okay? <laughs> and we, we live with listening to that because we know that they're trying to get it so that it's perfect for us. But all those notes played at random are not nice. But when the conductor gets up and he brings down his baton and they all play those notes at the same time, and that they're all periodic in chords so that they sound good together. That's what a mode locker does. A mode locker sits inside a laser cavity and says, go now, be at a peak now, all right? And so then what happens is that it produces that short pulse like I showed, but the pulses are moving at the speed of light. And so this pulse would come here, hit this mirror, go back, you turn around and come back. And inside a mode locked laser then we have a short pulse rattling around and around and around. Now a laser has to let the light come out or we wouldn't see it. So one of the mirrors is not perfect. So when the uh, pulse hits this mirror, some small amount of it comes out. And so while this one turns around and goes back, this one has gotten to be here. And then the one before it is already here. You can see it's a distance 2L away. And so you will see that by having, adding up these periodically changing um, colors that you now have in time 2L divided by C. It is the time between these pulses is given by the inverse of the difference in the frequency, okay? And again, this is the same idea. The more bandwidth you have, the shorter the pulse. The smaller distance between these colors the longer this is in time, all right? And so we have a mode lock laser puts out very short pulses. How short depends on how many colors you can put together. The distance between them is given by the round trip time of the cavity. 
Oops. All right. So the shortest pulses that we can see um, from a laser comes from what's known as a tie sapphire laser. So it, this is a p picture of Peter Moulton. Uh, at the same time that I was working on chirp pulse amplification in Rochester, Peter was um, working on making new laser gain materials. And he came up with a new one. And I just want to stress to any student that's listening, uh, my favorite laser book is, um, now why can't I think of his name? Isn't that ridiculous? I was going to tell you, to, oh, Sigmund. Okay, Sigmund's laser book. Sigmund's laser book, came, uh, Anthony Sigmund, came out in 1984, I believe, when I was in grad school. It's still a great book to have. And he sort of talked about ruby, which is chromium doped sapphire, would be the only sapphire made to lace. And, and he had reasons to say it would be the only one. And wouldn't you know, the year after he publishes this textbook, Peter Moulton comes along with titanium doped sapphire and shows that not only does this sapphire lays, but it has by far the largest gain bandwidth. So the cavities can make all these colors, which ones will be amplified depends on this stimulated emission. This is the curve of which colors see stimulated emission. And so it's almost 100 terahertz. So it could support pulses as short as five femtoseconds. Femtosecond is 10 to the minus 15. So like a billionth of a millionth of a second, very short pulse. And indeed, you can buy commercial lasers that generate five femtosecond pulses. In my day, I can tell you there were no commercial short pulse lasers. You had to be a laser jock to know, you know, have the skill to make a laser short. And now you can buy turnkey five femtosecond laser pulses based on this material that Peter Moulton uh, came up with. So this one is what short pulse people just loved when we saw it happen because we knew that we could have far shorter pulses. We were sort of at the 100 femtosecond region. Now we could have five femtoseconds. But remember the pulses are coming out, coming out, coming out, coming out. And so even if it's a one watt laser, if the pulses are coming every nanosecond, you only have a nanojoule of energy, okay? They probably come every 10 nanoseconds, so you have 10 nanojoules of energy. You don't have a microjoule of energy. You actually don't also have the very single femtosecond I want, but five femtoseconds is close, but you don't have the energy yet, okay? But we really have nice short pulse. And I wanna thank Peter. I asked him for the slide and I you know, got permission to use this. So Peter sent me this slide. All right. So that's one way to get short pulses and we're down to five femtoseconds that way. I should say though, that if we want to get the energy and we amplify them, just let me go back if I can. If we want to say, okay, we need more energy, let's go through a laser amplifier. Take note though, that this gain is highest here and drops by a factor of two here. So the more gain we do, the higher this peak goes up in comparison to this one. And so this is called gain narrowing. And so when you go ahead and try to amplify your five femtosecond pulses, you end up probably with more like 20 to 30 femtosecond pulses. You cannot get the really short pulses uh, by amplifying them up. All right, so again, why did I even do trip pulse amplification? I was trying to do an experiment that Stephen Harris at Stanford had theorized back in the 70s. His idea was it's great that we have this coherent radiation in the infrared and the visible, but wouldn't it be great if we could get it out into the XUV towards the X-rays? And so he said, let's forget about second or third harmonic generation where we add the photon energies. Let's, in the same way I showed the multi-photon ionization, let's add up nine or 11 or 13 of these and send out one photon one photon with the energy of the multiple, okay? So this was what we considered back in the 70s and into the 80s, high order harmonic generation. So I, you know, this was what I was thought I was gonna do for my thesis, okay, in the 80s. And this is why I built an intense laser so I could do this experiment. But while I was busy building this laser to do this experiment, along came a French group. Now this is not their work from the 80s, this is further on. But I'll tell you, they saw the 33rd harmonic. 
So why would I be trying hard to see the ninth harmonic when they've blown me out of the water seeing the 33rd harmonic? They weren't expecting to see the 33rd harmonic. I don't remember which one they thought they were looking for. Um, and I will tell you that when I showed the photons picking the electron up out of the um, well it was in, or when I showed you the harmonics, we were thinking it was a nonlinear optical phenomenon. When CPA came along and even the laser before that, that they were using in the eighties, the intensity was so high, actually we're out of the nonlinear optic regime. We actually are taking that well and we're turning it on its side and letting the electron come out. Now, this also applies for understanding her high order harmonic generation. I'm not gonna explain it. I'm just gonna use this to talk about how to make a short pulse. But what you can see is that it's only the odd harmonics. So they're not showing the third, fifth, seventh, ninth. They're showing 47, you know, and it goes up to almost a hundred here. This was done by the nineties. All right, but these now are in each one of these peaks is the bandwidth of the short pulse that I just showed you. And then it's, it's third, you know, I'm two harmonics away, two more harmonics away, two more harmonics away. And so this is an enormous bandwidth going out into the XUV. And so now they have this entire huge bandwidth. They're down making pulses between 50 and 60 attoseconds, okay? So I'm trying to talk about making a single femtosecond and they're, you know, 10 to 20 times even shorter than that because they have this enormous, enormous bandwidth. Now, the efficiency though is not that high. Typically they give up a million in efficiency. And so we want this energy and we're losing it. I will say though, that they're out in the XUV. And remember you can focus down to a wavelength. So each time we go a factor of 10 in uh, energy, down a factor of 10 in wavelength, when we get right down to the smallest spot size, then we pick up a factor of 100 in, in photon density, all right? If they could just keep this to 10 to the minus three, they wouldn't give up any on the intensity, okay? Then we'd be fine, because it would be 10 times, you know, for every 10 times, it would be 10 times shorter, 10 times um, this dimension, 10 times this dimension, and we would be fine but they're not there yet. Now, in coming to this talk, I just sort of feel like maybe I'm Goldilocks. The mode locking was maybe not enough separation of the colors, harmonic generation, maybe too much separation of the colors. So what do I work on? Oh, before I get there, let me just do one more thing. Um, Cause I want to just really keep coming back to what does this Fourier transform really mean? So this was the bandwidth and remember that uh, Peter Moulton gave us one that's 100 terahertz, but let's just use 10 terahertz. That's the entire gain bandwidth. The individual spikes are the wavelengths or the frequencies that are allowed by your laser cavity. Okay, that's the one given by C over 2L. And so they're separated by this. So that means pulses are coming every 10 nanoseconds. So I should have breaks in my scale here because the pulses from this whole bandwidth are as short as 40 femtoseconds. So we have 40 femtosecond pulses coming every 10 nanoseconds. So obviously my two scales here are totally different, right? You wouldn't see this, it'd be so short compared to this 10 nanoseconds. But because these are very narrow lines, the individual ones, that's, you know, the width of that line tells you how long this pulse train goes on. And a mode lock laser, the pulses come and come and come and come. There is a coherence time given by the bandwidth of this, okay? But let's not go into there. This means that you have this long, long, long pulse train, the energy per pulse is not very high. All right, high order harmonic generation, you're taking this whole bandwidth and it's inside here. I'll also tell you as soon as you amplify just one of these, which is what happens to make higher harmonic generation, you actually have to fill in and all the spectrum has to be there. That's what the Fourier transform tells you. You no longer have something repeating. And so you have to have something continuous here. It, you could also say that this distance between the pulses has gone to infinity. And so the distance between these has dropped to zero. All right, so that whole bandwidth is in one of these. And then it's the next two harmonics away, two harmonics away, two harmonics away. So if it's at about 300 terahertz, these are sitting at 600, tera, 600 terahertz away. We're adding them all up, 6,000 terahertz. 
That's why the 6,000 terahertz means you can have a very, very short pulse. They're 600 terahertz apart though. So the pulses are just 1.7 femtoseconds apart. But because you only have this many of them, right? Or just, sorry, because of the width here is 10 terahertz, that tells you you have a pulse train that's only 40 femtoseconds long, okay? So if you made these broader, if you use the whole 100 terahertz that he talks about, this would just be four femtoseconds separated by two. We would really only have one pulse in the middle and two down low, and that's really what they do in high order harmonic generation. So they really get about one pulse coming out. Not a lot of energy, 67 F, okay? So this is where we are right now. Pulses every 10 nanoseconds on the order of tens of femtoseconds or pulses that are really short, separated by not much, not that much energy. Now let's go in between, let's be Goldilocks here. This uh, is taken from my lab. These are the colors that we make and we send off a prism onto a piece of paper and just take this picture. This one comes from uh, Masayuki Katsuragawa's group in Japan. It's my favorite MRG spectrum. You can see it goes from the infrared into the ultraviolet, all these many beautiful dots, okay? So we have all these colors. It is a coherent process. If you were in my lab looking at this, you would really see how beautiful it is. Let me just, for those of you who maybe study vision, I just want to say the cones in our retina are amazing. We actually, can, not the infrared, we don't see the infrared, but once it's red, these yellows all look different to us and we see it turning um, from red to orange to yellow, then on to different colors of green, different colors of blue into the violet. Every different color our eye can tell apart. Three color photography cannot, obviously. We just have yellows, we have greens. <laughs> this peacock blue is not a real color at all. Um, and that's the best three color photography can do. So it's still a pretty picture, but trust me, when you see it with your eye, it's really beautiful. We see the entire rainbow of colors. So now you can see that in this one, they're very distinct, okay? And these are the different colors. So this would look like the spikes that I showed in the spectrum. Only the spectrum now is quite a bit broader than a Thai sapphire spectrum. A Thai sapphire spectrum um, can go across 100 nanometers, so sort of from the 800 to about here, and you can see that we're getting much broader than that. On the other hand, we are not. This is the second harmonic, right? This is one harmonic, second harmonic. The third harmonic is down here somewhere. So it's not nearly as broad as high order harmonic generation. We're, we're you know, being Goldilocks and we're right in the middle, just right. We can make one femtosecond pulses and we can do it efficiently. And that's the point. Up here, you can see that our blobs of light almost run into each other, okay? And so the width of each one of our colors is broader. So I'm gonna come back to that. Um, I should be watching my time. Um, am I running out of time? <laughs> so what is Raman scattering? Just cut me off whenever you want. Um, so this is called multi-frequency Raman generation. We have to go back to Raman scattering. Raman did this work in the 20s, so you don't need a laser for this. Uh, it's a linear process in optics. The idea is, is that, remember, we have a, a molecule, and this one will be vibrating, I'm not showing it to you, and in comes a light pulse. And that sets up a vibration, boom, boom, boom. Now, this one is also vibrating. This one's just vibrating more. But now if you made something vibrate more, that meant energy went into the molecule. The energy has to come from somewhere and it comes from the photon. And so what happens is that it lets go a photon of less energy. You start with the laser photon, you subtract the vibrational energy, and that gives you the energy of this photon. So it doesn't have to cause a vibration. It can also cause a rotation. You'll see, I can't have a line between them so I, cause I didn't know how to animate with the line between them. But anyway, you can also set up a rotation a rotation doesn't require as big a difference in energy. And so the change in energy from violet maybe only goes to blue and not all the way to green. All right. So let's think about um, what does this mean? Because it's very strange really to change the uh, frequency of a photon. It does not happen just when you go into materials normally. And so what's happening here if we try to think about it from a quantum point of view. 
So I told you that, you know, it's always vibrating, rotating. So we have this sort of what we call the ground energy. This is the lowest energy that molecule can be in. And then that next vibrational level is at a higher energy. And so when we talk about quantum mechanics and try to picture it, we usually have these energy ladders where we stack, these are the quantum levels that it can be in. So I'm only gonna show these two. Um, these are vibrations. There's also electronic, which is really what the laser usually couples to, and it's way, way up here in the ultraviolet. All right, so the laser comes in and it gets absorbed and it excites this up to this level. So there's no real level there. So we call it a virtual level and it can be there for a certain length of time. When I told you how dense do we need for a nonlinear thing to happen, I talked about the interaction time and that's the time that this uh, virtual level sits around for. All right, so if you're going to excite to this level, you can't just release the photon back to here. That wouldn't help you excite that at all. You release this photon here, and that's how you end up with the atom now in this excited state. So this laser beam loses one photon. You're not going to notice in a really you know, powerful laser beam that you've lost one. If you start with zero, you can notice that you now have one photon. And of course, it can happen over and over, and you can start to build this up a little bit. Okay, and again, the Stokes frequency is the laser minus the vibration. So it converts laser photons into Stokes photons. Now, when the laser came along, then you had this very strong beam and you caused the Raman to happen over and over and over again, and you made this fairly strong. And not only did you make this very strong, you can see that you put more and more uh, uh, molecules into this highly vibrational state and you did it more and more. In fact, now you had so many in this vibrational state, you could actually absorb another photon to another virtual level and cause it to come all the way back down to where it started. And this is known as the anti-Stokes. It actually has more energy than the pump it, by that same vibrational level. And so once the laser came along, this is called stimulated Raman. It is a nonlinear process. It's a third order nonlinear process. So it's like three, third harmonic generation, but it's not frequency up, up, up with one big one coming down. It's one photon up, one photon down, one photon up causing this photon down. And so this is how we generate uh, photons. I can tell you if an arrow comes down, it means it's an extra photon coming out. If it's an arrow up, it means we've lost those photons to give the energy to the atom or molecule. All right, so this was great. And once we had this anti-Stokes photon around, then they started doing spectroscopy with it. And they would tune the two colors against each other, right? And see when did they see this happen? And lo and behold, in Japan, this group tried to uh, move its one color laser uh, color around and they got so far off the peak of the gain curve that all of a sudden the gain curve made its own pulse and this guy still got amplified. They had a two color laser without thinking about it. It matched a Raman transition and all of a sudden all these orders came out. And they probably had to stop and think about why I can tell you short pulse laser people looked at all of those colors and went, hey, a way to make a short pulse laser, let's go for it. And so what is it? It's not like high order harmonic generation. It really is just the third order process over and over and over again. Here's the third order process I showed you, but now you go in with two strong lasers, you're making almost half the population up here and half of it down here. You now can you know, keep pumping it but you've made so much of this, it can be absorbed and make another one and another one and another one. You can also go down on the red side, okay? And that's how you make all these many, many beautiful colors, but it's a sequential process. I can show you that. We do it in a hollow fiber. The infrared comes in at this end and turns red and orange and eventually it looks white by the time it comes out and it looks white because we are making all the colors of the rainbow. So if we could time all of these up, there'd be enough bandwidth to make the single femtosecond. We're using 300 femtosecond pulses. So our length of pulse train would be 300 femtoseconds. They would be separated by about 50 femtoseconds. So that's six pulses in the train. And we'd have hundreds of microjoules. Just to show you that people have used this, 
This is a group, Sokoloff and Harris. It's the same Harris from Stanford, and Sokoloff was his grad student at the time. He's now at Texas A&M. They had this very short pulse laser, Thai Sapphire, pumped by a YAG, but they could use the green pump also to mix with this one, have their two colors. They took just five of the orders and off up, just a simple prism, put five mirrors, sent them all back. They could move the timing of the mirrors. They have to, they, that's, they have to be exact within a femtosecond. So that's what these phase things here are doing. They're just changing the time delay very slightly. This plate here was rotated so they could change the timing of these two from those three. That's this measurement. I don't want to explain the whole measurement. They showed they had sort of two femtosecond pulses from just those five orders. This one is beautiful. This again is uh, Masayuki Kastogawa's group's work. They go in and make all those beautiful colors I showed you. There's dispersion. So you don't get beautiful you know, uh, pulses coming out. You get gobbledygook because as I said, dispersion takes all of these phases and moves them around. They've shown that they can just use three different types of glass and undo the dispersion of their gas. And they indeed get out pulses that are just below a femtosecond. But they're doing these nanoseconds. Remember, they had very nice spots. They have very narrow uh, bandwidths. And so again, it's like a mode lock laser. The this pulse train goes on for 10 nanoseconds and pulses are coming every eight femtoseconds. They've got a lot of pulses in that pulse train. So the energy per pulse isn't gonna cause Coulomb explosion. So let's go back and compare adiabatic. They use 10 nanosecond long pulses. So their bandwidth is short, but they can make the short pulses. We're doing transient. Remember our blobs of color were much broader than theirs, right? And that's because we're starting with short pulse lasers. And so we have the sort of the terahertz of pulses. You can still get the single femtoseconds because that's coming from how many colors, but because we have broader ones, we can have a shorter pulse train. I will tell you that I don't think anybody has actually seen short pulses out of the transient regime because we have the added problem that we have to look after the phases of this on top of timing up the orders. Okay. I got into this because Leonid Losev here had done the theory in uh, Russia. And he showed that the transit regime was more efficient. He also showed if you could control the dispersion of your medium, you could make these many, many, many orders. So he wanted to come to my uh, lab to do the experiments. And the reason he wanted to come is that back in 2000, I published this two color Thai Sapphire. I have to say when I moved to Waterloo, my husband uh, was leaving Bell Labs and taking an industry job. He got to take his equipment with him and he had built this two color oscillator. So when I brought it, he, he started an industry job. So I just put it in my lab and said, what can I do with it? What else would I do with it but CPA it? So I took the two colors. So instead of trying to make the five femtosecond pulse with all that bandwidth, he made 200 femtosecond pulses and he could tune the bandwidths and the colors of these two through each other. And so you could do pump probe spectroscopy. I'm not gonna explain it, but we did amplify the two colors in this region, and then we can compress them as I showed you with two gratings. Okay, also this is on a timing thing. So we can change the timing of the pulses. We can also leave the pulses chirped by just moving the gratings in from the optimum or out from the optimum. I think I'm running out of time. So this just shows the top traces are what the oscillator can do. You can see that you can tune them and we could also then amplify the two colors. That's the bottom trace in each one. And so we, as I showed you, we do it in a hollow fiber so that it contains the nonlinear medium over a meter, quite often they're just a half a meter now, all right? We use um, sulfur hexafluoride and that's six fluorides around a sulfur and the um, vibration that we do is the symmetric one. So all six go out and come in and go out and come in. So we don't have to worry about rotations. We only have vibrations. And uh, we study the colors that we make. The first thing we did was try to get as many as we can because that's the name of the game. We want to, oh, I'm out of time. All right, I'll just two, a few more. Um, turn up the energy, we got more. I was ready. I was thinking, all right, let's get some prisms together. Let's do the same thing as Sokoloff and Harris. Let's try to make short pulses. Why didn't you go to the next one? When we got to even more energy, it does always stop. And we started to see this continuum. 
we started to wonder about it. But the student who did this, I said, let's also look at dispersion. And so he did this really cute experiment where he went to half the intensity, we had less orders, it's a different fiber, so we also have different spectrum. We chirp our pulses so that they're now quite long. And so we don't have what we think this other nonlinear thing that would create a continuum, and yet we still see a continuum over here. But when he went back to full intensity and halved the pressure, so that the nonlinear, nonlinearity would be halved, we thought we'd see the same thing, we don't at all. We see this huge continuum, we see dips in the continuum on the blue side, we see what we call the red shifted shoulder. I have to say this stopped us from trying to make short pulses. We went back to the drawing board and going, what are those? We looked at other people's data and sure enough, they see these red shifted shoulders. They just don't talk about them because the idea is how to make the most. Let me show you the most dramatic. Here's one where they've sent their colors through a, you know, off onto a piece of paper. The little dots are the ramen and there's these huge blobs of light on the red side. And I, I was sitting beside Mia Shan when uh, a different person showed this dot of hers. And I said, what do you think those big blobs of light are? Because the light's there, not in the ramen. And she goes, oh no, we think it's this four wave mixing. I went, no, we've tested that. It's not that. Anyway, I'm gonna end it there because I will tell you that we've gotten moved over. We will one day uh, make the pulse short. I have the money now to do the proper pulse shaping. But in the meantime, we're trying to figure out because it's just, let's off, go off the beaten path and go, what are these red shifted shoulders? We're trying to figure it out. We will generate a single femtosecond pulse, I have no doubt. Um, and just to know that my tie, beautiful tie sapphire laser is 20 years old, it gave up the ghost. So we're switching over and gonna uh, make a two color fiber laser system next. So let me just close with that and thank all the students. Frazier was a student who got, saw, saw those red shifted shoulders and turned us around. These are the students that have followed him. Alex was a postdoc working with Frazier. Uh, after Frazier left me for personal reasons, he wanted to move away from Waterloo. I had a bunch of undergrads that did a lot of the work and it's Leonard Losef that got me into this field. Anyways, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fiona, for uh, that fascinating talk you gave to us. So let me take a look to the chat to see that if there is any questions or if Wuxin can help me if there is any questions in the uh, YouTube. Uh, we don't have any questions right now, Pavzuja. Maybe you can ask, you know. Uh... Oh, okay. So I, I, I can see two questions here in the chat room. So uh, uh, one of the students is interested to know that what was your feeling when you got the Nobel Prize? Can you describe it? Um, well, it is at five in the morning for us. See, if over there, you guys would get to have the um, announcement for you in the afternoon, but it is five in the morning for us. So we are woken up. I mean, I, some people, I guess, are up at five in the morning, but I am not. So uh, we did get woken up. Um, then, you know, first thing is scary, right? We have adult children living somewhere else. Actually, they're now back living with us, but anyway, um, at the time. Uh, but my husband hands me the phone saying they're asking for Professor Strickland. Mm -hmm. And uh, they just say, um, please stay on the line. It's an important call from Sweden. So at that point, I'm like hanging on to my husband going, it's October 2nd and it's an important call from Sweden. I think it could be the Nobel Prize. Anyway, they had hung up on me. Um, but because they told me to stay on the line, I stayed on the line for 15 minutes. And finally I went, okay, is this just the cruelest joke ever? What is this, you know? So I got off the phone, got on uh, my iPad and found out that indeed there was an email saying, um, we're trying desperately to call you, can't get through, please call us. And so I had to call them, but um, it's, it's, it is, it's, you can't really describe it. It's really just quite something to think that you are getting this biggest of honors for physics. Oh, okay, nice. It was exciting. Yeah, okay. So there is a question from Serdar. Uh, he asked that is Roman scattering actually the up conversion in the game media that is mostly regarded as an unwanted effect? Robin scattering is, um, it can be unwanted. It can some, it just, it just depends on if you want to see it or don't want to see it. Um, we want to see it obviously in our case. Um, there are Raman lasers now that people are, are doing that. 
There are people trying to make short pulses through something known as continuum generation. And if you do it in fibers, it's a lot due to Raman generation um, that causes uh, the continuum. So um, it is uh, just a third order nonlinear effect uh, that can happen. It's almost like resonant cell phase modulation in a way. Um, and so it can be a strong effect. If, if you hit a resonance, you're gonna see it strongly. So it just depends on if you wanna see it or don't wanna see it. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is another question from uh, Melissa. She asked, uh, it was proposed that as the fundamental wavelength of the chair pulse amplification laser becomes longer, higher harmonic generation efficiency increases. Have you tried to build a mid infrared chair pulse amplification to find out? By the way, it was really exciting to actually interact with the inventor of the chair pulse amplification. Um, I'm not uh, working on, on that. I do know groups that are working on, uh, and they're, so they're using optical parametric uh, CPA in order mm -hmm. to get into the mid infrared. And so there are people that are three micron, some people have pushed to eight micron. Um, my two color laser, we have in the, we have uh, an old two color fiber laser that we had, and we did difference frequency mixing of that to make uh, wavelengths out 20 micron, but we don't have the kind of intensity. Um, that's probably gonna be more for like sensing the environment rather than um, high intensity work. Um, but yes, so, so I do know there are people there and certainly the people that got themselves when they went from Thai Sapphire just to 1.5 microns, they pushed further to the water window and the people that are at three microns have gotten further to the water window. Um, and that's just because uh, the width of higher order harmonic generations is given by the ponder motive potential and that scales as the lambda squared. Okay, thank you. So Emre asked how short light pulses we can send to the atoms. Are there any limits? Well, again, you know, when I was thinking about this talk too, I started thinking, you know, am I getting towards the, you know, the, the limit of, um, and a lot of people, a lot of people call it the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. That bugs me because it is just the Fourier limit. Okay, I don't quite know why Heisenberg sort of gets to uh, trump uh, Fourier on this, but um, you know, sort of momentum, space, or energy and time are 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 linked that way through the Fourier transform. So the shorter the pulse we go, uh, the less than we can know about the energy. Um, but we can also know the space better. So I don't think so. And certainly the people that are doing out of second work and trying to, to watch how the electron um, changes, I don't know that they've hit, hit the wall either, right? The, the issue really becomes, I, I think, that the shorter we go, um, the shorter uh, or the higher the frequency of photon has to be. Okay. I mean, I was going through quick when I finally got to the MRG is that what uh, Losef really showed was that in our MRG, if you phase match it, it actually helps the anti-stokes, which is great because we do want to, if we want to make single femtosecond pulses, we need to be in the blue, you know, getting towards the violet as our period, because you still, you know, you're going to have two periods in your pulse to make it a pulse. Um, and so I can see that eventually it, it's, they sort of go hand in hand, the shorter the pulse, uh, the out of second pulse are out into the XUV. So you really can only then look at these electronic um, things because you're, you're probing in the ultraviolet. So I don't know, maybe they can look at the ROM with these XUV pulses and get back and, and see the vibrations. Maybe they can, they probably can. Uh, I don't know that anyone is thinking about that. Um, but that, that's sort of the other issue. The shorter we go, we have to go out into the XUV. Okay, thank you. Those wavelengths is the point. Uh, two students ask, uh, and they would like to hear from you what you recommend for the young researchers and young students. Oh, I don't recommend it. I think you have to do <laughs> what you really want to do, right? I mean, because I think a lot of people try to figure out what's like the exciting thing right now. And you got to be careful of that because what's exciting right now isn't necessarily going to be what's exciting 10 years down the road. And I just know from my own experience that um, when I was sort of halfway through my time with Gerard, uh, Reagan Star Wars, Reagan, 
you're so, so young, you might, guys might not know who Reagan is, but anyways, the then president of the United States uh, was really um, trying to, you know, they were sort of locked in this cold war with Russia. And he started this idea of, of the sort of laser Star Wars where he was gonna blast uh, Russian missiles out of the sky uh, with lasers. And so there was a lot of money all of a sudden in lasers and in particular uh, high intensity lasers, um, high power lasers. Uh, and so a lot of people joined the group and you could tell that they didn't love it, you know? And I, I would ask them, why, why are you studying this? You know, it doesn't really seem to be something you're really, you know, as sure I would say passionate about. And they go, well, we, I just want a good job at the end. And I'm going, well, but you know, you know, it, you know, it takes us seven years here in Rochester to get a PhD, you know, th things can come and go. And certainly by the time I was looking for, um, after my postdoc for a job, Reagan Star Wars had come and gone. And there were so many laser jocks out there that it was, I struggled to find a job. So, you know, I still managed to maneuver my way around because I think I was working in something I really wanted to work in. So I think that's all you can really do is, is figure out what you really want to study because you'll do a really good job. I, th I think it's very hard to do a good job if, if you're not really enjoying it. Well. So uh, another student, uh, Ahmed, asked, uh, we have talked about intensity and pulse length, but can we always get longer wavelength in the infrared by doing several Roman stokes, or is there any limitation? Um, I, you can, as far as I know, we can go down uh, longer as well. Uh, why does he want to go longer that way? Um, I think that's, well, I don't know if you look at Losev's paper, he's the one who did the theory. It is more limited on the long wavelength side. Now he only went dispersion one way. I think maybe if he went dispersion in the opposite direction, he would have maybe found that it helped that. I think the dispersion null has to be under the colors you're making because it is a sequential process. So as you're making these colors, uh, they have to all be timed up together or they can't keep making the colors. So I think it's just a matter of having the dispersion work in your favor uh, but I don't know anybody studying it, trying to go to longer wavelengths. Most of us are trying to go to shorter wavelengths. Yeah. Uh, there is another question. Uh, what does the comment on the application of femtosecond laser in the medicine? So uh, do you have any suggestion, suggestion or any specific uh, application of the femtosecond lasers for the uh, medical applications? I don't know enough about medicine to really comment on that. I think uh, the only thing that the femtosecond uh, work came in is, is the fact that there was intensity. And so uh, there's also like a lot of microscopy with short pulses. Uh, and so you can uh, study a lot of the things that way because you can use nonlinear uh, microscopy techniques to find um, things out. But otherwise, no, I think it's just the fact that it's more intense. And so you can cut things that, and you can cut things that are transparent. So, uh, Ruchin, how much do we have time? Because there are plenty of questions here. Uh, so maybe I can ask one or two more. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, thank you for the nice talk. One of the students said, and uh, what could be the future perspective and novel application of the possible new technology behind the idea, especially in biological imaging at cellular and tissue levels? Well, again, I don't know much about biology at all. So, I mean, I am just a laser jock. So I mostly try, try to get a laser to go somewhere that it hasn't gone before and let somebody else come to me and say, this is what I want to use it for. So even when I first built the two color CPA, I knew I would try to do mid infrared with it, but you know, people like Losef came to me and said, try this. Warren Warren, you know, came to me and said, you should be trying trip radio, but adiabatic rapid passage. There was things, you know, I usually just try to make lasers out there and wait for other people to come to me. Okay, I'm asking the uh, last question. Uh, Ahmed again asked, uh, what about random triggering? Could we get intense pulses at random incident of time while keeping the intensity? I... 
Shandar. Well, you, I mean, it, mm, that one I don't know. Um, it depends on what you mean by random. You have to have all the colors lined up together or they don't time up to be a short pulse, right? So all of those colors have to be, whether, I mean, you can have your pulses coming at random times, but that's probably more likely that you have multiple pulses and you're picking them with, you know, like in our lab now, we're setting up an AO modulator um, to lower the rep rate. But it could, it could be at a constant rep rate or it could be a random one if you wanted it. But it wouldn't help you make a short, shorter pulse. The short pulse is really about getting as many colors as you can all lined up together. Okay, so. I have the question. I have a question. So, how do you see the future of uh, fiber lasers to achieve very, very short pulses? I mean, that auto second pulses. For example, if we use ethereum doped fibers, you know that the gain, the bandwidth of gain is almost 30, 40 nanometers. But we can, uh, by nonlinear effect, we can achieve something like 100, 120 nanometers. But we can never achieve less than one femtosecond by the fiber lasers. So in the future, what do we think that, the, that can we replace uh, solid state lasers with the fiber laser to achieve very high energy and very short pulses? Well, I think really the advantage of the um, fiber laser, which is what I'm going that way too, over the Thai Sapphire is, I think the Thai Sapphire has the bandwidth, right? And so the things that we're doing um, fiber has the advantage that you have these long interaction lengths, so nonlinear optics is easier to play with than it is in the Thai Sapphire. But in both cases, we're using nonlinear optics to do the mode locking in the one, and we're doing it the other to broaden the bandwidth out. Um, it's, to some extent, it's not lasing anymore. It is going to always be nonlinear optics that's used to make the short pulses in one way or another. So uh, I think the advantage of fiber lasers is the fact that it has much higher average power than Thai Sapphire, right? It, it, the pumping is over a long distance, so it can handle the um, thermal load, on, and the thermal load is not nearly as high because we're pumping at 975 and lasing at one micron, and so there's very little um, energy that has to go out as heat as well. So that's why you can have kilowatt average power um, lasers, and I've seen people with their kilowatt average power short pulse intense ones when I was at Livermore. Um, I find those very scary. I wouldn't want those in my own uh, academic lab because you have to really have some controls on those because you could be, I don't know, slicing your fingers off or something. Um, so yeah, I'm a scaredy cat. So I don't, I don't want to go to kilowatt average powers. Okay. Okay, so uh, on behalf of all the participants and uh, Boazich University, especially physics department, I. Thank you again. I appreciate you for this call, uh, talk. And I hope to uh, see you in uh, Turkey and in Boazic University in future. Okay, thank you very much for having me. Thanks all. Thanks for all the good questions.